Hi, welcome to Inside Church. We trust that the Lord would minister to your heart and that faith would be built as you listen to the message. Amen. Come on. There's a place of intimacy with the Father that no human being can fulfill. Really is real. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Well, I'm going to go to truth is the life in the kingdom, part three. If you hear nothing else, hear God's word of truth. This becomes a greater and a greater revelation to me. And I guess I've been on the journey for a while now, looking at the truth of God's word. But there is nothing that is slightly off track with God. If He says it, that's it. But we have to have that conviction in our heart. If He said it, that settles it. And I receive it. Amen? So let's get into the Word. Father, thank You for Your Word this morning. Thank You, team. Thank You for Your Word. We appreciate your word. And you've made us ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And so we thank you this morning as we open our hearts to hear your word. I thank you in the name of Jesus that the anointed word of God is imparted to our hearts that as the truth of your word comes, so does it illuminate the freedoms that are available to us in Christ. And Father, thank you. The truths of healing, the truths of peace, the truths of sound marriage, the truths of the returning King, the truths of walking in dominion in this hour when the Things in the earth look so bleak. We thank you, Father God. It becomes ever more glorious for us as we walk in the truth of your word. We give you glory and honor and praise this morning and thank you that as we hear your word, faith grows because your word said so. Faith will grow in our heart. And so you empower us by the truth of your word for greater and greater exploits in the kingdom of God and bringing hope to a lost and a dying world. In the precious name of Jesus, we bless you for this now and give you all the glory and honor. Amen. 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 Will you turn with me this morning? family to, um, did we greet the Revival Centre? No, let's greet the Revival Centre as well as they're going to feel. <laughs> Amen. Welcome Revival Centre. Welcome. Glory to God. You might be sitting next door, but you're part of the family still. Amen. Because thank God this morning, like all every morning, when you get up with Jesus, there's no distance in the spirit realm. Amen. Amen. So I want us to look at Matthew 5, verse 13 to 16. I'm saying this and I'm saying it carefully. Will you become obsessed with the truth? You know, we're obsessed with all kinds of opinions. We're obsessed with philosophies in the earth. But will you become obsessed with the truth of God's Word so that God's Word and God's Word alone will stand the test of time for your life? Amen? Amen. 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 And here we go. Matthew 5, verse 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth. That's not a request. That's a statement of truth. You are, whether you feel like it or don't, you are, because the Bible says so, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? 
But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. Think about that. That's what the Lord calls us. This is Jesus speaking. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp, a type of your life, and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all those who are in the house. That's your life. That's your life. Now you can see why it doesn't matter how you feel. It's what the Word, God, Word of God says about you. And you align yourself with these truths. Not when you woke up this morning, looked in the mirror and didn't think you had a good hairdo. Amen. Amen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light so shine. We're not talking about walking around like a glow worm. Truth reveals light. Amen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Then I'd like us to read verse 17 to 20. Now in Matthew, um, and particularly in the beginning of the Gospels, there's a lot of reference to the kingdom of heaven. So these are truths. And the danger is that we move on from them. Because we're now mature. You never move on from being the light of the Gospel. Amen. Do not think, Jesus speaking, verse 17 to 20, do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. That's the promise. Till all is fulfilled. And so sometimes when we see, when we see the, the chaos in the earth, we think, where's God? God's at work in those that believe him and he's unctioning those who don't believe him. But the Bible tells us, and that's what we believe, the Bible tells us that everything will be fulfilled. In other words, every prophetic word that has been spoken by God, that has been put down on the pages of truth as men were moved by the Holy Spirit to pen things down, so it shall be fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks, listen to this, whoever therefore, he's not talking to pastors, he's talking to people. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. By declaring to your brother and sister, you are the light of the world, you are declaring that very thing. Don't look for truth that you think would wow the people. Bring truth that is real about the salt and the light. There's nothing with great, there's nothing wrong with great revelation of the end time. But these are the truths that keep you on the road and will make you run this race with faith and patience. When the enemy comes with condemnation, remind him I'm the salt. Now, you may remember nothing grows in salt 
And that's part of the context of what we're speaking of here. Because doubt and unbelief cannot grow in a salty believer. Come on, family. Doubt and unbelief cannot grow in a salty believer. Come on, we really need to remind ourselves of this. Then he says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's interesting that um, Jesus draws a parallel to religious people and says, if you're going to be religious, you're not going to make heaven. This is about truth. This is about knowing Jesus as the Lord and Savior of our life. So the Bible has many teachings instructing us how the kingdom functions. And that's what I want you to get this morning, the simplicity of, not me personally, that's the that's what the Holy Ghost has been prompting me for many, many months, probably some years now. Just walk in the truth, son, and you'll be free. Now, when you say that, it's great, but when you go out there, then there's nothing but lies, and then we can allow ourselves to be contaminated with the lies of the world instead of the simplicity of truth. The simplicity of truth is that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. Are you with me? So that's why I'm saying the Bible has many teachings instructing us in regard to how the kingdom functions. And we must align ourselves with it, how the kingdom functions, not how inside church functions. There is, there is a place where we, we know, you know, we don't write on the walls, we don't function like that. Those are simple, basic things. But this church must function in line with the kingdom. Otherwise, you'll never come to a true kingdom understanding in your life because the kingdom of God is within you. It's not an outward expression, okay? Now, one day when we get to heaven, that's the place where God resides. That's a different conversation. But right now, the kingdom of heaven is at hand and it is in us. If the Bible says we are seated in Christ Jesus in heavenly places, then the kingdom's within us, must be. And we have the authority. You cannot be an ambassador if there's no kingdom. You see, what happens with mankind, and they did it with Jesus. When Jesus came into the earth, they wanted to make him a king. He was already a king. But they didn't see the kingdom of God. They saw a natural authority that will run around with a sword cutting off people's ears. Not that. That's not the kingdom. So he said, my kingdom is not of this world. He said, I'm not here to establish a natural kingdom. Because God is spirit. But there will be an outworking of the natural. Am I making sense to you this morning? Help me, Holy Ghost. So Jesus comes into the earth from the Father. And he brings two characteristics with him, the Bible says. He brings many, but two in 1 John 14. He brings grace and truth. Remember, they were under the law. There was no grace. You commit adultery, we stone you. Done. Okay? Jesus comes in and he introduces the true 
kingdom. Now the law was brought because of sin of man and it was a tutor to us till we come to a place in Christ. But once we come into a place in Christ, the law, if you read through the Old Testament, is no longer us because God's law is written on our heart. The highest law that there is in all the earth is the law of love. Because you don't need commandments when you understand love because you won't hurt anybody. Come on, family. Can we hear this? It's so important. So then he says in John 14, 6, he says, he's also the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. So we can make statements of I serve Allah, but that's not good enough. Because Jesus said, there's no ways you get to the Father except through me. That's the process. That's the process of the kingdom. So the reason God brings Jesus into the earth is for reconciliation with you and I. I want you to hear these truths. Because when you go into the earth and things are looking adverse, there's adversity against you, then you would probably want to question if you're a normal believer that's just learning the ways of the kingdom, you'll say, if God, well, the devil will help you. He'll say, if God loves you, why is this happening? He doesn't say he's the sucker that's behind it because he's the liar and the father of it. But you, can you understand? So God sends Jesus into the earth. He says, now the kingdom has come, but the purpose is to reconcile us to the Father so we begin to live out a life of truth in Christ Jesus. The Spirit of God is called the Spirit of truth. Come on. And so when we get baptized in the Holy Ghost, we are empowered to truly live in truth because he's the author of the pages of this precious book. And so if we allow him to teach us, we gain to walk in greater dimensions of truth. And the whole purpose is for reconciliation to the Father. So think of that. You're part of a family. You're part of inside family, but there's a greater family, the Father of all spirits, the Father God Himself. He's looking to be in union with you. So I'd like to unpack, did we get that? You need to go back and revisit these truths. I go back often and I look at the reconciliation of the Father with me, that Christ, so that I get the magnificence of that truth, that Christ, God in the Father, reconciling Himself, reconciling me to Himself through Christ. These are amazing truths. And when you understand them, the devil can't condemn you because that's where so many believers live in a state of condemnation. Amen. So let's drill down a little bit into grace. Grace is the gracious act of God towards man and it applies in a literal sense in a figurative sense, and even spiritually. So I want you to get this. The reason grace came into the earth was to influence our heart because there's nothing we've done or can do 
to appease God. It's, it's, it's the most amazing truth that He loves us in spite of us. He draws us in spite of us. He asks for nothing in return, but we can't please Him. But the Bible does say that faith pleases Him. Because that's an outworking of our love for Him. So people say, I don't want to hear about faith. I'm not interested in this faith stuff. Well, how do you please God? If you, you don't please God through prophesying. Come on, family. We need to just look at these truths. So grace, and I want to go to a scripture here. Grace is having a divine influence on our heart. And when that grace comes to our heart, it begins to reflect out of our life. And so if you go to Romans 6, Paul writing to the Romans, he says, now the grace has come, should I sin? He says, God forbid. In fact, thank you, Lord Jesus, I'll go there. Let's go to Romans. I just want to unpack this grace thing a bit. Not on, we, we got to watch the time, yeah. I think we should get to the stage where you're sitting in the windows and you fall out and you die. We're here so long and I just come out, <laughs> pray for you and you come alive again. Yeah. Amen. If you knew your Bible, you know what I'm talking about. I want you to see this just, this was not in my, in my notes, but I just sensed by the Holy Ghost. Um, well, let me go, let me go. Okay, thought, Lord. Uh, let's go to Romans 5, verse 20 and 21, then we'll drop down into 6. Moreover, the law entered that the offences may abound. You see, you cannot reason God's Word. What we are reading here is truth. Listen, moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound. The Bible says that if there was a law by which we could have been saved, then that would have been done. But there is no such law, okay? But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So in other words, the stinging nettles of sin are nullified. So that as sin reigned in death, even so, grace might reign through, listen carefully, righteousness. Not grace to sin, it's grace to righteousness because we have nothing we can bring to the Father in our own. That's why this body cannot go to heaven because it's contaminated. And so we, when you and I go to heaven and when we're caught up with the Lord, if, we, if, if we're caught up and we don't pass through to through the death realm and just get caught up by the Lord, in root, in seconds, we get a resurrected body that has no sin on it. Look at this. So that as sin, are you getting this stuff? Well, this is a bit hard on a Sunday morning. So that as sin reigned in death, even so, grace might reign through righteousness, to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we know that getting saved, this eternal life has begun. Amen. Remember, it's not breathing. Eternal life is not breathing. Eternal life is reconciliation to God. I don't know if spirits breathe. I'm not there yet. I don't know what happens to spirits, but I imagine they breathe because Jesus ate food, walked on the earth, etc. Then drop down verse chapter six, verse one, and Paul brings such a profound truth to us. He says, what shall we say then? 
Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because we think that grace is an excuse to live in sin. And it's not. He goes on to say, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not! Exclamation mark. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, get this, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Grace. That's the truth. So we walk in a newness of life. Amen? Amen. Got it? So truth creates the environment for faith to function. Faith cannot function in deception, in untruth. It cannot function there because its source of life is the word of truth. You can have a natural faith. If I came here and I sat down on this chair, I would be exercising faith, but it will be a natural faith, not a spiritual faith. But what we're talking about here is a spiritual faith where we speak the word of truth, which then, as Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, sanctifies us, sets us apart for a life in the kingdom of God, which is different to what everybody else is living throughout the earth. And then it sets, it's this very faith that sets, and you must get this, it's this faith that sets people free. Are you with me? You will see religion, they are not free, yet they're reading the Word of God, but they're reading the letter. They're not aligning themselves with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so it's important that we understand that. So faith, you may buy a car through faith. You may... That's not wrong, but that's the lowest level of faith. Faith is how to believe that I'm reconciled to God my Father, that I can walk into the throne room of God and whatsoever I desire, when I pray in the name of Jesus, it shall be given to me. Though a thousand fall at my side and 10,000 at my right hand, it shall not come near me. That's what faith is for. The other just is added as you go through life for your Father knows that you have need of these things. Amen. Now, because of our numbness and dumbness, the Lord brought the word of faith to a place where we had to learn just how to believe God for a job. And you should use your faith all the time. But do you understand? If you're a true man of faith, you will never, woman of faith, you will never be unemployed. Now that's a tough one to swallow. I'll go there, Lord. I wanna just put it in with the Word. I want you to see faith in action, Jesus speaking truth. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, the works that I do, He will do also. And greater works than these, He will do because I go to my Father. 
the Father's always present. And whatever you ask in my name. See, as you grow in truth, you become less self-centered. You become more Christ-centered, which then opens your heart to the well-being of other people. And God just takes care of you. Are you with me? Look at this. And whatever, that's why we need to have a kingdom perspective and understanding and living for the kingdom. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father, not the Son, listen, the Father may be glorified in the Son. The Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So what happens is the more intimate you become with the Lord, God Almighty, the Sovereign One, you'll find that your requests deviate from self-centeredness. And you go on to another route. It's amazing truth. It's truth. See? Okay, let's move on a bit here. So, so truth creates an environment for faith to function and sets man free in the liberty of Christ. The best understanding that I can bring of liberty is a slave who has no rights. We don't understand slavery. We understand apartheid, but not slavery. It's a different league. No rights. That's where liberty comes from. That's the, the where you had no rights. You didn't realize this, but you had no rights to life outside of Christ. It's only when, if we go to a lost eternity, sorry to be sounding a bit morbid, but it's the reality, we go to a lost eternity that the demons beat the hell out of the spirits down there. They're not having brah lace. They are the brah lace. When I was unsaved, we used to joke and say, well, we'll see you on the other side. We'll have a brah race in hell together. We didn't realize how foolish we were. And by the grace of God, He heard that, but He forgave me. The power of the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen, family. It's, it's just amazing. So I want us to look at some more Scripture and then we're going to start going to... Um, yeah, maybe I can get all these scriptures out quickly. I've still got a few more minutes. Um, there are more scriptures that I'd really like you to see. So the liberty, and please try and understand this. Listen to this message so you get the truth. The liberty in Christ is a catalyst to provide us with self-determination. Do you know what the world's fighting for? Self-determination. Every nation. Self-determination, every ethnic group, self-determination. Yet God has given it to the church within the context of heaven. Did He not say, go into all the earth? Did He not say that? That's self-determination. Within the lines of truth, within the boundaries of truth. And those boundaries are limitless if you stay in truth. So a self-determination and an independence living in autonomy outside of sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? That there is, there is no sin that can hold you. There is no sin. I don't care how dark it is. 
I don't care how you feel. It's got its tentacles in you. Truth and the blood expels it. That's a fact. That's the truth. So freedom in Christ, and I'm going to give you the Scripture, is the ability to produce fruits of righteousness. Maybe we've got to let the Holy Ghost take us here to teach on righteousness. Think of it. The righteousness of God. It's mind-boggling. That's who we are. You better understand, God has confidence in His Word when He makes statements like that. And we look at our lives in the mirror and go, really, Lord? Really? Really. Really. That's our status in God. So freedom in Christ is the ability to produce fruits of righteousness through a Spirit-led Lifestyle. Go with me to 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10, and we'll give you scripture so that you can see this. He, now, he, now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of righteousness. Is that what the Bible says? Who am I going to believe? The Bible. Now he may he who supplies seed to the sower. Now I know this is used as a financial tithe and offering message, but I want you to see what is the true seed? The Word of God. The Word of God is the true seed. Jesus said the Word is seed. He spoke of sowing seed, the Word. Right? So let's look at Philippians 1 verse 11 as another scripture, just so that you've got these references. If the enemy comes and wants to put out a whole lot of lies again, just rebuke him. Um, in fact, I'm gonna go right up, it's, it's a bit of a long read, but I'm gonna go up to Philippians one, chapter one, verse three. Paul is talking to the Philippian church um, because there's a few problems in the church. How many of you know you won't find a perfect church because we're all in the work in progress? I, if you came here this morning believing you can contribute to the perfection of this church, praise the Lord, but you're not perfect. <laughs> Amen. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Isn't that beautiful? He's talking, he's writing to the Philippians. Always in every prayer of mine, making request for you with all joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think of this of you all, because I have you in my heart, in so much as both in my chains and in my defence and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of this grace. How beautiful. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you all. I wonder how many of you would write to Inside Church like this if you were not here. We've lost value. We've lost value. And this I pray, that your love may abound still. Wait a minute, where am I? I lost my way here. Verse what? Verse nine. Oh, there we are. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ, 
being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God the Father. I'll take that and read that letter to you as the church of insight. A godly life in an ungodly world is not a simple assignment. A godly life in an ungodly world, this is not an excuse for defeat, listen to me. A godly life in an ungodly environment the world is so ungodly, is not a simple assignment. It requires the wisdom of God to live life skillfully in this earth. Experience may help, but your battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Amen. And so experience may help, but it's not it. We need the wisdom of God in living out this life in the earth skillfully. And to that, I want to go to the Scripture we closed off on last week, which is such a beautiful Scripture. Proverbs 4, verse 18. Bump your neighbor and say, now listen, this is truth. Get it. Come on, you got to get this. Simple. Proverbs 4, verse 18. But the path of the just is like a shining sun. But the path of the just, remember, you've been washed in the blood of Jesus. You are now justified. What does that mean? It means just as though you have never sinned. Get your mind around that. You need to renew your mind. I stand here and God looks at me through the blood and sees me as an heir of salvation and has no recollection of my previous life. Only the devil will try and remind of that part. But he has thrown it into the sea of forgetfulness. Glory to God. That shouting material right there. Free from, <clears throat> sorry, back up. But the path of the just is like a shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. <clears throat> Let me say this. Oh, come Lord Jesus. I don't know if I can make it to the end. <laughs> what a lot of garbage, man. Listen that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. The coming of the King. Shining ever brighter. So you're not getting dumber, you're getting wiser. If you're in the Word, come on family. Don't let the devil lie to you. Don't let the devil lie to you. So I just want to smash that last excuse out before you go to lunch of why you can't do it. Here it is, perfect, free from any flaw or defect. You are free. You are free. Read Romans 8. I am free from indwelling sin. Sin cannot dwell in me if I don't entertain it. Come on, family. Free from any flaw or defect. 
This is the truth. In condition, in any condition, all quality of life. It doesn't mean there wouldn't be adversity to you. But as you take the truth of God's weapons of warfare from this Word, you will nullify those adversities. But I've been trying for years. If you wait upon the Lord, please hear me, family, as much as I love you, I cannot entertain your words of death. The Bible tells me, if I wait upon the Lord, He will, not might, He will renew my strength. He will cause me to rise up on wings as an eagle, that I'll be able to run and not be weary. I will walk and I will not faint. That's the truth of God's Word. So what I've just read here in Proverbs 4.18 is God's perfect desire for every born again believer. Jesus reinforced it when He said, in abundance to the full till it overflows. Meditate on these truths until your mind can only think God's way, not the world's way. You know, you go to a doctor and there's a condition, we're not knocking doctors, but there's a higher doctor whose report will you believe? You with me? You know? So that's where we walk on. So now I'll close with this. It's incumbent upon each one of us this morning, to ask ourselves, is this truth, the magnitude of this truth, is it truly a reality to us? Many years ago, God said to me, <clears throat> I can't just think where the scripture is now, but there's a scripture that says he will show you the snares of the evil one in your pathway. He will show you. Telling you that the devil can't do anything without you knowing. Come on, family. We must ask ourselves, is this truth a reality in our life? What truth? but the path of the just. If you do nothing else but look at yourself for the rest of 24 and say this for plenty more until it becomes a reality to you because it will go from your brain to your heart. Then it'll turn into faith and faith will motivate your being to believe and do, free from any flaw, defect, condition, in quality of life. You see, I cannot, as much as I would sympathize with you, sympathy won't bring you the truth. It doesn't mean I mustn't sympathize, but in, while sympathizing, bring the truth. Bring the truth. Bring the truth. God bless you. Amen. That's not the right scripture. It is. Jeremiah 17, 10. Ah, the Lord, probe the heart and discern hidden motives to give everyone what they deserve, the consequences of their deeds. And Jesus highlights this with the lady that doesn't give much. 
And we, being materialistic and not necessarily seeing things in the spirit, we look at the, the amount that we give and we deem that faithful. And yet the Lord, He lays out conditions of how He wants your heart to look when you are generous. He, wants, he lays out conditions of how your heart should be when you are generous, when you are giving. Paul says this, he says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Why does Paul have to say that? Because there is room where you could be compelled to give beyond what's being prompted in your heart. You understand? As the Lord wants it to come from you. This is in a response to the relationship that you have with God. This is in a response to the grace that's been extended to your life. This is in response to the love that's been poured out. You don't love God because you love God. You love God because He loves you. That's what it says in John. It's a response to what's taken place in your heart. And we can't live a religious life outside of faith, grace, and truth. What do I mean when I say that? We need to have an authentic relationship with Jesus. The reason that I'm giving is because I'm responding to the goodness of God in my life. Pastor Craig just highlighted it. As we grow in truth, we no longer are self-centered, but Christ-centered. The motivations of your heart begin to change. Maybe you start out pursuing riches, but in the end, you'll be pursuing Christ. Those are the true riches. That's what Jesus said. If you will not be faithful with Mammon, how will you be trusted with the true riches? What are the true riches? It's the revelation of the kingdom of God. These are the true riches. And so I want to encourage you this morning, when you give, and you must give. That's not a compulsion statement. That is, you must give. Paul instructs the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He says, on the first day of each week, each one of you is to put something aside, store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collections when I come. What is he saying? He's saying, church, I want you to put aside money every week. That's what he's saying to the church. That's Paul's instruction to the church. So that there wouldn't be any collections when I come, I'm just gonna grab the bag of loot and I'm gonna head out and I'm gonna distribute to the saints as you've collected. But he's laid out conditions of the heart for this giving. And it's what? Not reluctantly. Not under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. You say, Josh, I don't wanna give. It's not there. I don't have any, it just doesn't come. I don't want, when that offering basket comes past, I feel guilty like the guy at the window on Argyle. It's not Argyle anymore. I don't know what it is. I see Bola Lingua Drive. The guy at the window, you suddenly, you're checking that gear stick if it works. You can feel his presence there, but you just need to adjust that button there. I'm just going to ease forward a little bit. That, that giving, when you give to him, it's not because you love him. When you give to him, that's compulsion. That's not flowing out of a generous heart. It's to ease your guilty conscience. That's selfish giving. Now, maybe it helps him and he goes and buys some bread, but the Lord's not interested in that transaction. He's looking at your heart. Do you actually care about that man? You actually love that man like I love him. Remember Jesus when you go out. There's a chance that they'll come and approach you. They want your opinion. Maybe they want you to fall into a trap so that they can attack you. Remember Jesus. That's who you represent. You carry the fragrance of Christ. How would he respond? Amen. So as we give this morning... Respond as Christ would give. Amen. Thanks for watching. We trust this word takes root in your heart. To stay in touch, visit the website linked below. We'd love to have you join in person soon. Be sure to visit us in Durban, South Africa or Charleston, USA. 
Have a blessed week.